When we talk about death, we have to honor it. If we talk about looking at the birth of a child, when we look at that, there's an excitement and enthusiasm and everybody in our circle, our friends and our family, they're all waiting for that big moment. They're waiting for the phone call, they're excited. But when that baby comes into the world, that is a traumatic experience for that child. It is leaving a place of comfort, of nurturing, of security, but it's gonna be met by people and friends who are waiting for them and excited to have them. There is no difference between laboring to come in this world and laboring to leave. We are met by family on both sides. And for anybody who's been touched by COVID and you couldn't be there for somebody when someone passed, remember this, nobody passes alone. You might not from an ego standpoint have been able to be there for yourself to wish them goodbye. You might not have been able to hold them and hug them in the physical, but rest assured that loved ones and friends are there to greet that person as they make that transition. Nobody passes alone. Welcome back to Max Out, everybody. I'm excited about today's show. I was a little nervous, too, when we were booking this, but uh, I gotta tell you something. Today's gonna be one of those, you're gonna share it with people, and there'll be definitely conversations about it because of who my guest is. He's a psychic medium, but he's been a guy that I've followed for about two decades, and I've been fascinated by and interested in, and now that we've connected in person, I consider him a friend, so I'm excited. John Edward, thank you for being here, brother. Thank you for having me. First, first guest. Yep. In a year in person because it's the same well, first time doing something in a year in person so mm -hmm. i felt like it was important to be here in person um no barriers yeah thank you it was his idea that we do it in person and already our energy connection has been unbelievable confession i have to say before we start i'm sure you hear this often i was i wanted to talk with you so badly over the years i followed you my dad and i had talked about you many times then i thought well Am I going to catch some flack? So I literally asked for permission from some of the top faith leaders that I know. I'm not kidding you. One of the mega pastors in the world. I said, hey, I'm thinking about having him on. He said, absolutely, you should have him on. So those of you that have faiths that may or may not believe in these things, I've got permission from some of the biggest dudes on the planet. And they, what we talked about was this gift of discernment being mm -hmm. something that many people have. And so I hope everybody listens with an open mind today. You can draw your own conclusions. And, but for me, it's something that I wanted to do up close and personal with you. What I'm most fascinated with is, this is a unique gift you've been given. Is it something all of us have, this idea that we can feel energy or see things potentially? Do you think everyone has that gift? I, I do, and, and I actually, in my practice, tell people that um, gift is like a four letter word in right. a way, you yeah. know, it's like, because it makes it seem like I'm more special than mm -hmm. somebody else. So whenever I'm talking about intuition, I like to use and hype up underlying you know, italicize the word abilities. Because when we think about someone's abilities, mm -hmm. then we could talk and navigate about how they develop their abilities. Okay. When you say to somebody that like, you know, or if I say, I have a gift, right? Depending upon how that comes across. Yeah, I can see that. It's now coming from a point of, it's mine, it's only mine, and maybe I'll share it with you. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, I have an awareness, I have a practice, I have an understanding, I have an ability, and let me share it and teach it and show it and demonstrate. And by the way, you do too. And that helps people not need me, yeah. which sounds kind of crazy because it's my job, right? right? But I feel like my job is to be a teacher. Mm. So to say that I have a gift kind of takes away from somebody else who's listening to this, understanding that they have an ability and that ability, if it's worked at, if they understand it, they recognize it, then they're going to be able to recognize when their loved ones and friends are around them. Or, you know what? I don't really have a good vibe about this person. Yeah. Maybe I should trust that. Hmm. and not talk myself out of, oh, no, 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 they're really great. Yeah. And here's all the reasons why they're really great, only for three years later to realize, yeah. no, they weren't so great. And I knew that in the beginning. And hmm. why didn't I trust that? Trust the gut, trust yep. your intuition. When I say gift, I think sometimes I mean proclivity, mm -hmm. meaning that I feel like different human beings have, you're born potentially with a certain set of proclivities that maybe you're stronger in those areas. And as 100%. You, you work on them. And outside of, outside of the realm of like my world, I'm, I'm down with the word, like people's gifts and using them. Mm -hmm. But I always like to kind of hyper focus on anybody who's interested in intuitive understanding that it's really about energy mm. and understanding the realm of said energy. Gotcha. When did you know you had it? Okay, so I was 15 years old and my mom's side of the family loved psychics. Okay. Loved them. Psychics, seance, astrologers, card readings, you name it. It was like happening at my grandmother's house. It was kind of like a Tupperware party for family and friends. They just take out the Tupperware, bring in the psychic. My dad was a New York City police officer and a career, career military guy 
who hated the subject matter with a hot, fiery passion <laughs> and forbid my mom from allowing me to be around it mm. up until when they were like divorced. I was like 12 or 13 years old. And then we moved into my grandmother's house, which as I say, mm. was the paranormal hub of activity. No but I, although it was closer to my mom's side of the family, I did adopt a lot of the philosophies just by nature of being around my dad. Sure. I didn't believe in the subject matter. I thought it was something that only women did. Um, I used to make fun of it. I was extremely disrespectful um, to the... Were you really? Yeah, I really was. I really, really <laughs> was. Um, to the point that, you know, my mom would like look at me and be like, you know, knock it off. Like the Italian, like, knock it off. Like, just, <laughs> we're going to leave it at that. Um, and then something, you know, do you want the abridged version? But the, yeah. the, uh, I had, you know, if you in high school, you have to go for a physical? Yes. Okay. So my mom couldn't take me for the physical. I went for the physical and my cousin take, takes me and they come back and they tell, they tell my cousin that um, they need to alert my parents that I may have a brain tumor, right? Really? Yes. Okay. So my cousin had had a neighbor who had died from a brain tumor. So right in that moment, she turned green. Um, and I'm like, like looking at the doctor and I'm like, looking at my cousin and I'm like, I don't have a brain tumor. Right. Like I knew I didn't have a brain tumor. Mm. So then we would call my mom. My mom's like, she's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking like, okay, she's in Manhattan working. She's probably gonna be flipping out, but she didn't, she was pretty cool. I get home and I was like, so like, what's the next step? Like, what are we, I'm practical. Like, what's the next thing? Like, who's the doctor, the specialist? And the response I got back was, don't worry about it. Everything's fine. I'm like, okay, cool. So you got an appointment with like specialist? And she said, no, nope. I spoke to Lydia Clark and I go, who's that? And she goes, she's a psychic. And she said that you're going to be absolutely fine. And I literally remember standing in my mom's, my grandmother's kitchen going, wait a second. <laughs> like, right. like, do I need to call my father now? Like, like right. to get, get a, with, a, like, a to real a doctor. Right. Like, and she's like, but we're going to a doctor, right? And she said, no, no, we're going to go for the test and everything. She's like, but I feel better because Lydia said that. And I'm like, okay, great. Good for you. You know? <laughs> so then I go for the test and everything was fine. Mm. Everything came out fine. And she was like, Lydia was right. And she said, I invited Lydia to come out to grandma's house to do like a group because now everybody knows the story. Now everybody wants yeah. to have the reading by Lydia. And I'm like, okay. Then she proceeded to give me stuff that was, I would say generally specific. Mm. It applied to me and it made sense. But I can also go, mm. I can apply that to like five other guys that are like sophomores in high school. Mm -hmm. And then she landed information that there's no way possible she could have known. She gave me information that my mother did not know. She gave me information that if my mother did know, I felt like I would be in trouble. Mm -hmm. So I lied. And I said, I don't know what that is. But you did. Oh yeah, she's spot on. But I, <clears> I couldn't <throat> explain how she knew it. And then she smiled and she looked at me and she did this like, you know, like raise her eyebrow thing like, okay, <laughs> let me tell you how that's gonna wind up. And she proceeded to give me outcomes. And one of the outcomes was not logical because of the circumstances involving this girl that I, we were talking about. And I'm like, that, okay. I was like, in my mind, I'm like, yeah, that's not true. Well, there was a piece of information that was missing that I didn't know about that within two weeks, everything she said happened. Whoa. It blew my mind mm. and it didn't blow my mind to the point of that. I paid attention to the first part. And I say this openly, if somebody's not ready to be read mm. and they don't think that this is real, and then you have an experience where it's, it's real, it doesn't feel cool. Mm. It feels like you've been robbed. It felt like I was, vi I felt like she was like, she violated my space. Really? So. For me, when I came out of the room, my mom's like, so what'd she say? Mm -hmm. I wasn't telling her about the last part. Mm -hmm. So I made a joke and I told her about the first part. Mm -hmm. And my mom looked at me and she's like, maybe you're right. Maybe she couldn't read you like that. Like it was like, a, like yeah. and I remember I walked up the high school, um, my elementary school was behind my grandmother's house. And I walked around the field for a while trying to figure out like, how could she know that? Who could have told her? Nobody. I would have had to tell, tell her those things. Mm -hmm. So that sent me on a quest for information. And I went to the local public library and I was embarrassed to check the books out because they were under the occult section. <laughs> and the occult just sounds bad. Mm -hmm. So I sat on the floor of the Glencoe Public Library and I literally read every book that they had on anything metaphysical or psychic related. And what I found was that I didn't think that they were psychic books. I was like, it's not psychic, this is common sense. Like we all mm. have this on some level. So then I started asking questions to my like, friends. Like, have you ever seen your dead grandfather? Mm -hmm. And they'd be like, no. Mm. I'm like, that's not normal. And they'd be like, Whoa. no, that's not normal. Mm. I'm like, really? Like you haven't like ever like, just like seen something. And they were like, they were like, no. You went 14 years of your life thinking seeing a dead grandfather was something everybody did. Completely normal. And I'll tell you why. Cause coming out of the shower one day, I was towel drying my hair. 
my grandmother was watching and I will tell you exactly what the show was. It was Love of Life. It was a soap opera that she had on sitting at the dining room table. And when I pulled the towel off, there was a man that was sitting in the, like my grandmother was here. The TV was over there. My grand, and this man was sitting at the table and he kind of like looked back at me and smiled. And it startled me because then he was gone. And my grandmother was like, what's the matter? I was like, there was a man just sitting there. And she goes, describe him. I go, it kind of looked like Uncle Jakey was her oldest son. I go, but he had more, more hair and a space between his teeth. And she's like, yeah, it's your grandfather. He's just sitting in his chair and watching my soaps. And then went back to it. No, no skipping a beat. No like, oh my God, that's amazing. No, like that's weird. No conversation about it after the fact, nothing. Mm. So I was raised in an environment where I thought that was normal, mm. right? And it wasn't, and yet I could still be skeptical about the subject matter. Yeah, that's interesting. Yep. So I have that. And when I, you see this person, John, when they're sitting there, do you know it's not a physical person that it looks like a spiritual viewing when you see it? Or can you make any distinction between Mike sitting right there and that? Well, yeah, well, Mike doesn't disappear. <laughs> okay, so he just disappears. <laughs> Yeah, he's still there. He's still there. You know, so yeah. it's like, we're, we're good because Mike stays. Okay. But in the beginning, that was something that would happen. I don't get that now like that. I don't see that in the same way. Okay. And my journey was, you know, I started learning more about the subject matter. Knowledge is power, right? Mm -hmm. Knowledge is power. And the more I was able to recognize something, then I had to go back and reframe things. And I always tell the story that in fourth grade, I got in trouble with Mrs. Worthley because um, there was something that she always gave us her 10 vocabulary words and then extra credit. And I would get the extra credit right. And then one day she gave us a very hard word. She gave us the word phlegm. And most kids spelled phlegm, F-L-E-M. Mm -hmm. And I spelled it correctly. And they wanted to know, was there any type of extra credit? Was there any type of medical professional that was helping me with information? Because how would I know how to spell phlegm? So I happened to be there at the parent teaching conference that my mother and my aunt went to. And the teacher said, how, how would he know that? And I said, well, she wrote it on the board. And the teacher went, I, I did not write it on the board. And my mom was a stickler for telling the truth. Mm -hmm. So if something happened, if I told her first, we were good. If she found out from somebody else, that was bad. Mm -hmm. So being truthful and honest and upfront and direct was like how I was trained that, that I had to be. So I remember like looking at my mom and I was like, she's, li to like, she's lying. That teacher was lying. She wrote it on the board. And when I look back on that, logically now, where the teacher's desk was and where I saw it on the board, there's no way logically she would have been able to get up, walk over, write it on the board and get back to her desk in the amount of time of her actually giving the words. Mm. So I recognized that I saw it on the board. Mm. So that's like one of those moments I had to go back. So I've had a lot of those, right? Do you go think back it was, can I ask you a question? Do you think it was actually really on the board? No, it wasn't, it was in my head. Man. I just saw it on the board, mm. which is why when I read for someone, like if I had to sit here and do like, you know, a group of people, mm -hmm. I would probably look at those panels because there's nothing on there. So that would become my focal point for what I would say. Fascinating to me. So this is interesting. I'm watching your legs go like you're getting excited yeah. when you do it. So if you're listening to audio, like he's getting fired up. And as I'm listening, I'm processing what you're telling me. There's still this part of me that's, I don't think skeptical is even the word. Unrelatable, maybe to some extent. I like me. the word skeptical. Okay. And I'll tell you why. Okay. I think there's a difference between skepticism and cynicism. Okay. What's C the difference? Cynicism means nothing's possible no matter how much evidence and proof is put in front of you. You've made mm -hmm. up your mind and that's, your, that's, that's mm -hmm. cynical. Skepticism goes, hmm. I'm not sure. Show me. Okay. Give me some validation. Give me some type of backup and support. And that's how my entire career has been. I think it's always important to have some level of validation when you're doing a reading, not giving, you know, just loving spiritual messages yeah, of peace, right. light, and love. That's what I like about you. You got this New York kind of edge to you. You did have that sort of traditional Catholic upbringing on the one side. Yep. And then the psychic, I've, I've done my research. And then the, the kind of the psychic stuff on the other side. I want to go, there's so much stuff I want to unpack because sure. we're just getting going. But I want to step back. Again, I want to say one thing about the, the pastor that I talked to. I was surprised when I said, what do you think? And he goes, I um, strongly believe in discernment. And in fact, I'm not going to say who this person was just because I don't want them to catch anything negative. Sure. But this person actually said to me, and he goes, and I'll be honest with you, I believe I have some of those abilities. And um, more than I like to even talk about sometimes. And I do see things from the past. And I do sometimes have a very clear vision of what's going to come in the future. And I've always felt that it was validated in the scriptures that I read, not invalidated. And so it made me really excited, actually. I don't know why I needed permission from another man, but, so that, but someone I think that was maybe deeper into that particular doctrine than I am. But it was you explore, that was you exploring your skepticism. I think you're right. That, when you just, the yeah. reason I said that after you said that is that's exactly what I think I am, then, is I'm a skeptic to some extent. But not very much. I'll tell you why. 
I think everybody listening to this has had some experiences with deja vu mm -hmm. or experiences where they've just felt energy very strongly. Like you said about, you know, I've met people like, this guy's the most amazing person in the world. Everyone loves him. Then I meet them and You're I'm like, like, not for me. Right. And the times that I didn't trust that, I did ultimately regret rejecting my intuition. And so I'm a huge believer that the people that I know that are very successful in business and even personal relationships, they rely on intuition far more than they do just techniques and tactics out of business 101 or social media school. Intuition is a huge part of life. Energy is a huge part of life. But I'm wondering, a lot of people, when they find out they're good at something, I used the word gift earlier. I think we both define what it means. No matter what yours is, you found out you've got this gift for teaching, this gift for touch, this gift for humor, this gift for um, dis uh, discernment, this gift for caring, nurturing, intellect. Sometimes people, when they figure out they've got this thing, it almost scares them and they retreat from it to some extent. And that's what holds them back all their life. I think right. unhappy people to some extent know there's something they could or should be doing for the greater good of other people and are rejecting their calling. And that, that's a, that's a formula to live in misery. Anybody listening to this, regardless of what it is for you, you're this young man. Now you're becoming more aware. This is a little bit different than everybody else, or I have more of it to some extent. I can, I have an ability to tap into it maybe to an extent others don't. Did it scare you? No. Did you realize you were different? Was it, it didn't exciting? scare me. It okay. was more like, how does this work? Like, how do I get better? Like build the muscle? Yeah, like how, exactly. How, how do I, how do I, how do I learn about this? And um, my mom's younger brother was married at the time to a woman who actually did like card readings. And okay. she wouldn't call herself a psychic. She just read, she read cards. And I remember sitting next to them. She was reading for my mom. And I, I heard, you can do this. And it was like to the point that I wanted to be like, who said that? Like, okay. like who said that? And it was, it was like a, I want to say it was more of a knowing. So for anybody that's like listening to this, there's a moment where you'll have this. It's not a, I want this. Hmm. And it's not, I need this. It's, I know this. Hmm. And when you know something, it's better than believing in something. Hmm. So for me, the, the, like, I knew it in that moment. And that was, that was a very defining moment for me where I like got up from the, the place where they were doing the reading and I, I walked away and my mom said, did you hear something that you didn't like? And I went, nope. Hmm. And I, I kind of kept it quiet for a while. And I was like, I believe I can do this. Hmm. And I went to the I went to a bookstore, excuse me. <clears throat> it was a Walden bookstore on Glen Cove Road. And um, there was nobody in it. And I went to the, of course, in the back section again, because that's where all the books were, in the back mm -hmm. section. And what I found really interesting is the shelves had this kind of like curvature to it. And I was about two or three feet away from the, the bookshelves. And I was kind of just like looking at what was there. And, and I would equate this for any guy who's going to buy condoms in a in a pharmacy <laughs> where you don't want anybody watching you like picking them up. Right. Mm. And that's how I felt exact same analogy. It's like, <laughs> like I'm looking at these books, but like I'm close enough to the other books that I can like reach over for one of those instead. <laughs> so I'm standing there and I'm like, not near the shelves. The woman who's managing the store is in the middle of the shelf, a uh, middle of the bookstore. She's restacking stuff and she's about maybe 12 feet away from me. And a deck of tarot cards fell off. Like somebody went and I'm just like, I watched it happen and I'm like, shut up. Right. Wow. And the lady goes, well, clearly you're supposed to buy those. Wow. So I did. Yeah. And I bought my first deck of cards. So, you know, I go home, don't tell anybody. And I'm like looking through the little book of cards that, you know, the meanings of it. And my grandma's house was always hopping on a Sunday. Right. Okay. She had 11 kids who had kids who had kids. So, you know, packed, packed, packed. Okay. So uh, I said to my cousin Florence, I, I was doing readings and she's like, oh, my God, totally read for me. So I did. Okay. So there I am, you know, with the book. And I'm like, well, this means this. And, you know, mm. and about two weeks later, she called me and said, are you going to be at grandma's house on Sunday? And I go, I live here. Of course, I'm going to be at grandma's house. Okay. Why? She's like, would you, would you do my cards again? And can I bring five friends? Mm. And I was like, wait a second. I'm like, N no. Mm. And I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. She's like, well, everything you said happened in the last two weeks. Crazy. She's like, and I told my friends and they were like, well, can you get it to do for me? And that's legitimately how I started. Like mm -hmm. I started reading for like cousins and then the friends of my cousins and then their mm -hmm. friends. And then it became that type of thing. And I started working at psychic fairs and that was the journey. It's interesting when you tell stories, I told you this off camera too, by the way, everyone listen to this, you get to make up your own mind, right? About this, these, the different aspects of what John's talking about, how it works for you in your life or doesn't work. But 
you know, and I want to make clear that for everybody as well, but one of the things that you do very interestingly is we're both huge energy people. Mm -hmm. You obviously feel it. I want to talk about that next. I want to talk about the application of some of these skills in every person's life listening or watching this. How can they apply some of these skills in their own life? But when you tell a story, first, you're a great storyteller, but you're, you. but you're, it's true, but your energy changes. I see you as a little boy when you're telling these stories. We did a few off camera too. Like I actually see the little boy. That's not normal that when someone tells me a story that I actually begin to picture the boy. I can see him and feel his energy when you're speaking. That just, it, it tells me at a minimum, your ability to transfer and feel energy is at an extraordinarily high level. I just want to acknowledge that in you. It's not normal. In fact, I don't <laughs> think anybody else I've ever talked to has that, um, that ability. Somebody, everyone's laughing <laughs> off camera here, you guys, because it's actually true. Everyone feels it here. But let's talk about energy in general. Sure. I'm a big believer that you need to protect your energy in life, right? That's and why so we're going to be friends. That's right. I, I know. That's exactly <laughs> why. And I, I also feel like you have this great analogy about the pool, too. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if we just get this lesson. More than ever in the world are there competing energy forces that are coming at us and leaving us at any given time. Sure. What advice would you give to someone just trying to be happier, live more productively regarding the people around them and the energy they bring? First, we have to do inventory. We okay. have to look and let's make this about shopping. Okay. If we're gonna make a dinner for your family and you decide that you're gonna make lasagna, you may or may not, without getting up and looking at your cupboards and looking at your fridge and freezer, you may or may not have what it is that you need. So we have to assess and take inventory before we know what we need and what we no longer need. So mm. there are certain things that you're gonna go, you know what, I, I have the cheese for lasagna, mm -hmm. but it expired a year ago. Mm -hmm. So I need to get rid of that. Mm -hmm. So we need to assess and take, take inventory. What is going to be needed for the ingredients of what we're building or making? Now. For the now, mm -hmm. for this, you know, not mm -hmm. the meal that we had last year, yeah. but the one that we're making now. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about what are the ingredients? I mean the people and the energies. Mm -hmm. And when you make that lasagna, it's, la it's layered. Mm -hmm. And there are certain things that are great by themselves. Mm -hmm. And there are certain things that are great when they come together. Mm -hmm. But then if you travel internationally, you know that there are certain things that they'll put in your lasagna where you will go, ew, yeah. not in this one, mm -hmm. not for me, right? Mm -hmm. So using the layers and the inventory, we assess what works for us and what doesn't. And then we have to be honest. Yeah. We have to be honest that we might love this person. We might love this person more than anything. But if this person doesn't work in the lasagna of your life, wow. then we have to make a decision to not include it hmm. and to recognize that this is toxic. Hmm. So there are certain things that um, in part of working with energy that I've had to recognize that this is not a positive person. This is not a positive circumstance. This is not a positive situation. And I'm gonna move that. And, and I think one of the earliest things is, you know, growing up with an alcoholic father, mm -hmm. Um, and losing my mom at a very young age, I, my mom on her deathbed literally begged me to have a relationship with my dad. Mm. And I said, no. Mm. And she was like, you're going to deny me a dying woman, her last dying wish. And I said, yes, I am. Mm. And she said, why? I said, because it's a promise I don't know if I can keep. Mm. And I said, more importantly, it's a promise you shouldn't ask me to make. Wow. And she said, you said this is an 18, 19 year old boy. I did. Yeah. And she said, why is that? I said, because I need to do what's best for me. And what if he's not what's best for me? <laughs> and now, why can I say that at 18 or 19? Well, I can say that because I'd already been doing readings for four years. Okay. I had already been exposed to understanding the language of energy, the tools of the language of energy, you know, whether it be numerology, astrology, cards, psychometry, all these different, you know, things that were, let's call them symbolic languages to help us amplify the way the universal energy works. And so, yes, I was able to quite confidently say I, I wouldn't be able to do that. Now, that doesn't mean that after she passed, I didn't make my attempts, I, which I did. Mm -hmm. And I knew they weren't going to be successful. And it, they weren't self-fulfilled prophecies because I really did try. Yeah. And I know that he did in mm -hmm. his own way, but they just weren't going to be in this lifetime. Yeah. So, well, I think it's a powerful thing. I want to jump in and come back because you're going in such an awesome direction. It's never been gone on the show before. And that is that just because somebody is your blood doesn't mean they're the right energy for you in your life. I think oftentimes people kind of, they'll buy into this notion that this friend of mine no longer serves me, right? Um, their energy no longer serves me or maybe never did. And I finally got the confidence maybe to do some separation from that energy. 
but it's much different for people when it comes to family sometimes, don't you think? Yep. And, and, and that, I, I think what you're saying is giving somebody permission uh, that if that is your intuition, if that is your energy, it, just because you share a blood with somebody does not mean their energy necessarily is, it sh should be required in your life. Yep, and boundaries are important. Mm. I think it's very, very important. We create boundaries everywhere in our lives, right? You have boundaries while you're driving your car, those are the lines on the highway. Mm. You have boundaries in your home, your property lines and survey. You can't buy a property or a house without getting a survey and knowing where the property lines are, right? Mm. And that's where you build your life, within the survey of those property lines. Mm. Um, but we don't look at that energetically. So I want people to energetically look at where the property lines are for them and to know that it's not okay for your neighbor to encroach on your property and take the fruit of your trees mm. without your permission, mm. right? So it's not okay for, and you'll see this with siblings, you know, if you have two sisters and one's stealing the other one's clothes, going in the room, taking their stuff, that's a violation of someone's property. And sometimes parents don't say, hey, 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 mm. ask first, or mm. it's okay. So I think it's important to establish healthy boundaries energetically from a young age. I did that. I did that learning about this work. Very good. Let's even go a little deeper. What is this energy thing? Like, like people are listening to this, they're like, is this just how you make me feel? In other words, if I'm evaluating someone's energy in my life, mm -hmm. would that be the best way to describe it? This is how I feel from you? Am I energized, not energized? You take from me, you contribute to me? So who are we as people, right? Mm -hmm. We look at each other and we assess us by what we look like in this world, mm -hmm. right? That's why racism is apparent, because mm -hmm. people see differences and they assess those differences. They define who they are by status of those differences. Yeah. But yet if you did not see people for who they were, but you only heard them mm -hmm. and you only communicated with them on a level, whether it be corresponding with words mm -hmm. and you cannot see or hear them, then you're dealing with a communication of their consciousness or energy. So that consciousness or energy, which resides in this vehicle is kind of who we are. Mm -hmm. And then inside this vehicle, it gets amplified. Mm -hmm. So using vehicles as an analogy, if we were to drive down the highway of life, you'll see all different types of cars and you will, whether you want to admit it or not, see someone in a vehicle and assess them for why they're driving that vehicle. That's right. You will see the older guy in the hot red Ferrari, you know, with the convertible mm -hmm. and the young woman in the car next to him and immediately think, yeah. you, but you don't realize that that's actually somebody who's a really successful person who runs a car dealership and that is his granddaughter in the car, right? <laughs> so that assessment is based upon a judgment or an energy or what people are projecting out. But then there is the exact opposite of that where what you thought to be true is true. Mm -hmm. So you have to always like discern mm -hmm. or read the energy of a circumstance mm -hmm. without prejudging it. Mm -hmm. So I always go to this one example. I never look at my clients and go, oh, well, they're probably here to hear from that person or they probably lost that person. I've always been wrong. If I've ever done that. Really? Yeah. So I don't do that. I wait till like it comes out in a reading. Mm. And I remember having this couple who sat in front of me. And if you would have said before the reading, how do you think they're connected logically? And who do you think they're here to see? I would have been like husband and wife and one of the most parent. Mm -hmm. He was her nephew. She was younger than him. His mom was her sister who had passed. Whoa. Whoa. And I, I, I literally remembered that moment. And that reading has got to be from like, 1995, no 1996. Way. Of all the readings too, yeah. right? I remember that clearly because it was just like, you know, if you were to assess, like assess the energy of who you thought somebody was, yeah. I would hundred percent would have been wrong. Yeah. So I waited until I got what came through and then kind of went there. But my point of looking at who, are, who we are, we are an energetic vibrational fre frequency, a consciousness, a soul, call it yeah. whatever you want. Mm -hmm. I like the word energy. Mm -hmm. um, inside this physical manifestation mm -hmm. where we have free will to make decisions in order to affect changes as those things ripple out. And I talk about a line of probability. On our line of probability, the past happens, can't change it, but you can learn from it. The present is where we are right now. But from this moment on into the future, that's not written yet. And what you do with your energy and your thoughts and how you project that is how that actually will manifest. Bingo. Three billion percent agree. This is the most important. I don't know that we can cover anything more important than this on the show. Like, I, it's hard for me. You articulate it better. It's hard for me to explain why I think some things in my life are, you know, better than average. Let's just say it that way. And I'm a freak about this topic. I'm a freak about transferring energy. If I'm trying to persuade, it's the transference of energy. If you're in my, if it's, if it's comforting energy, you know, um, intense energy, but I also am such a protector of my own and who I allow in my pool, which I want you to give yep. that example in a minute, because 
uh, for me, it's been the number one shift in my life is this idea. And by the way, for everyone listening to it, this concept could be new to you, this idea. Just start to be conscious of energy, of transferring it, of your vibrational frequency. Those of you that are people of, uh, of faith, if you're a Christian like myself, you can believe in all the things you believe in and still be aware that there's an energy field, that there's still transfer of energy. There's a vibrational frequency with human beings. This is, this is not a debatable fact. No, it's, it's, not energy. A, it's, 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 it's a science. It's a real thing. And so I, I am a huge protector, especially as I get older. My friends are very diverse. You could have a really well-known actor, entertainer is a friend of mine, and my bestie runs a transmission shop, right? A buddy of mine's a flooring contractor and another guy's a professional football player. Because you know they're, what you do. They're, they're, yeah, their careers are, it's, for me, it's not what they do, it's who they are that matter in my life. It's the energy they bring me. I love, I love humorous energy. Most of the dudes around me the, or the ladies around me are funny people because I want to have that part of my heart expanded. But talk about the pool part of it, if you would, because this is the best of the best analogies. So one of the things that I am kind of known for besides like, you know, doing what I do analogy yep. wise is I want to inspire people. I want yes. people to live a better life. I want them to evolve with where, where they're at. Yes. And some folks, when they come to see me, you know, they think they're coming just to talk to dad and then they get all this other stuff and they're like, but I'm not here for that. I'm like, no, you didn't come here for that. Right. It's not, that's not why you came, mm -hmm. but it is why you're here, because otherwise you wouldn't be sitting in front of me. Mm -hmm. I go, so just put it in the back, mm -hmm. remember what I'm saying. And one of the things that I tell people is that we are an energetic pool, mm -hmm. and I like everybody to think about themselves. So if you can imagine yourself sitting in a jacuzzi, right? Because mm -hmm. it's a, not a pool pool, but it's a pool, right? So you're in, you're in your pool. And imagine that you're in your space, your energy, and who do you want swimming in your pool? Mm -hmm. And they like look at me like, well, what do you mean? I go, well, if it's your pool, right, in your house, you would invite people to come over and come in your pool. I said, so now imagine, let's take somebody that's very popular, like Oprah. Mm -hmm. Oprah gives you the invite of the century. You're allowed to come to her house for a barbecue and a pool party. You're so excited, you go, and Oprah says, just dive in. And you get to the pool, and it's green, and it's murky, mm -hmm. and you can't see the bottom. And I'm like, do you all want to swim in that? Mm -hmm. And then I watch. I watch the people in the audience, you know, the cheerleaders who go like, yes, 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 you know, <laughs> and then you see the other people who are like, yeah, I don't care whose pool that is, right. I'm not getting in, right? right? So the reality is you don't want to swim in a murky green pool. Mm -hmm. You don't want to swim in something that's not mm -hmm. like that. It doesn't matter whose pool it is. Mm -hmm. You want to swim in a pool that's clear, mm -hmm. you know? So when you think about the inviting of getting into someone's space and pool, if you've been invited into that space, Good. you want to think about it from the perspective of, okay. I want to get into a pool that's clean and clear and it's inviting. Mm. But now if it's your pool, you want to keep it clean. Yes. You want to keep it. So your pool isn't going to stay clean without work. Mm -hmm. So you got to keep your pool clean. Very good. And the way that you do that is with your filter. So your brain is the filter mm. and your thoughts are the chemicals. So what you put into your filter in your pool is going to be what keeps it clean. And then you got to actively work at it. You got to skim it. You got to vacuum it. Mm. You know, you got to make sure the chemicals are regulated. And every time somebody's in your pool, if you've ever, if you ever, if anybody's ever had a pool, you know that the more people in it, the dirtier it's going to get. Yes. Sometimes you got to shock it. Sometimes you got to keep people out of it. Sometimes mm -hmm. you got to put the cover on it, but you want to keep it cool. And most importantly, you got to make sure nobody pees in your pool. <laughs> and people look at me like, I can't believe you just said that in front of all these people. I'm like, there's no pissing in the pool. Mm -hmm. Right. And that is something that I'm very, very clear on who mm -hmm. I let in my pool, who mm -hmm. I will not let in my pool. Mm -hmm. Whose pool I will go in, whose pool I will not go in. Yep. You know, and my, my wife might get gets a little uncomfortable sometimes because I'm very, very clear about that. Yeah, me too. I love the um, between lasagna and pools, I think everybody's finally gonna get this. <laughs> the mixture of those two analogies is really something I'll have to work on. But I gotta tell you the pool thing, I told you this off camera too. My my uh, the pe the amount of people in my pool is smaller than when I was younger because I am so conscious of protecting who's in it and I certainly don't let anybody in. That's amazing to me, so many of you listening to this that have said, I want a better life. I wanna change the external conditions of my life, but you won't change the internal conditions of your pool. You keep letting people pee in your pool constantly and somehow you think your life's gonna change. You have to change those components. And, and by the way, there are some people in our lives who were supposed to be in our lives for a certain time. Right. Their energy served us at that time. There doesn't make them bad or good. It just Correct. means it's what it is. And that's the next thing I want to talk about. And we're going to get to readings in a minute. But this notion of everyone listening to this, including you and I, 
wants to improve our life to some extent. We want to find even another level of happiness, another level of bliss, another level of contribution. We want to help more people. That's what everybody wants. But people fall into patterns. In fact, humans are patterns to some yep. large extent, right? And that's another part of this energy piece I want you to talk about. But in the terms of humans and their patterns, because I've watched people, they've got a brand new business they're all excited about, but they still run these same thought patterns, these same energy patterns in their life, or they're in a new relationship. So there's a new person, but somehow they run a pattern of every relationship they've been with just a new person in the relationship. Yep. They don't change the pattern. So do you notice those things? And is there any advice oh you give to somebody on that? Every day, every client, every group, every Zoom, everything I'm doing, mm. it's to get people to recognize what are those patterns. And I'll say to them, you know, you're coming to me right now because you want to fix your grief. Mm. I can't fix your grief. Mm. I go, I could raise your awareness. I go, here's the difference. You need to plug your phone into the outlet to charge it. Mm. You want to plug into me. I go, I'm, I'm just an anchor, anchor block. You know what I'm saying? Mm. I can give you a little bit of a, of a, of a boost right now. Mm. I go, but when you go back to not being around me, your phone's gonna be almost dead again. Mm. I said, so you need to figure out how do you charge your own phone, right? Mm. And mm. you gotta charge your own phone in your own way, mm. not in my way. Mm. I could share with you what works for me, mm. but that's, the, that's like the equivalent of somebody like, you know, hiring a nutritionist and getting a gym membership and doing nothing with either one of them and going, I'm fat. Like, I can't <laughs> lose any weight, you know? And like, that, that, that is the, like, if you ever come to me, like, that's the place not to go, because mm. I'm brutal. Mm. When people are like, you know, am I ever going to lose weight? Drop the fork, join a gym, <laughs> like do a diet. Like, mm -hmm. don't ask me questions like that. Mm. So from a, from a pattern standpoint, mm. you, can get, you can get physical fitness and weight. You can understand if you don't make changes, you don't see results. Mm -hmm. So this is energetic fitness. If you don't make changes, you won't see results. You're going to see the same thing. And yeah. oh my God, with the excuses that people make. Mm. So if they come to a person like yourself or they work with a life coach or if they go for a reading and you see the potential of opportunities where they can make changes and then they give you all the reasons why that can't happen. Why are we talking? Right. It's like, you gotta be willing to make the changes. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna negotiate with malignancy. You're gonna cut it out, right? Wow. Yeah. So it's like, okay, are we gonna like, you know, talk to our cancer mm -hmm. or are we gonna get rid of it and treat it? Mm -hmm. So you gotta figure out what's the toxicity in you. Mm -hmm. So you, again, real world example, I like to work with both medical doctors as well as holistic approaches. Mm -hmm. So one of my doctors has a holistic approach and he said to me, I noticed that you have a lot of fillings. And I go, I do. Mm -hmm. So he goes, we need to get rid of some of the mercury. Mm -hmm. Great, no problem. So I, you gave me a directive, I'm gonna go do it. Mm -hmm. So I talked to my dentist, I don't have a lot of time and schedule. I might've made the mistake of doing it all in one sitting. <laughs> a six and a half hour day oh where my gosh. all of it was done, dental dam, did the whole oh. thing. Go back to my doctor and he notices and he says, oh wow, he goes, how, how often did you go? And I go, doc, I did it in one day. He goes, sit down. And I go, what? He goes, we're doing a mercury test on you. I scored the highest level of mercury <laughs> that he's ever seen in his entire career. And he goes, now we're going to do a chelation treatment. And mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. what does that mean? He goes, it means yep. that we're going to be sitting here and we're going to do a chelation. We have mm -hmm. to pull the mercury out of your system as mm -hmm. best. So I had like two or three chelation treatments over a period of time to yeah. be able to get rid of the mercury. Mm -hmm. So now I laughed and said, okay, I'm psychic. Should I have known that? Right. No, right. no, I should not have known that. Should I have done my research to know that? Mm. Yes. But what I did was I looked at my schedule and said, oh my God, I can get it all done right here, right now. Mm. And let me get it out of the way. Mm. Not always the best idea. Yeah. Sometimes you need to do things and, and, and it's got, you have to be able to, and I should have known better, honestly, because I use an analogy. I say, you can't frost the cake until it's baked. And right now we have the ingredients sitting on the counter mm. and you can't talk about the frosting. So I frosted the cake before it was baked. That's so interesting. You I paid for it. Do that. So, the the uh, there's so many things I think of when you're talking because I like when you you tell stories. I said this earlier. I can picture the story. It just blows my mind. But and it's just a very interesting gift that you have, and it keeps happening every time you're telling a story for me. Maybe that's just that our energy is connected as well. But let's go to a little bit because the, the people have these patterns. They've got these people in their lives. These readings, right? I was just thinking last night we we're getting ready to do this. You know, I had a gentleman on our show that's one of the most watched and viewed shows we've ever done that had a near-death experience. He was dragged under a train. He took us through the experience. And it's interesting as he described his transition to where he was going. Uh, it's very similar to how you describe uh, having a guide come. Mm -hmm. All of those things happened. Um, 
that you describe and what you believe is the process when someone crosses over, no pun intended. And um, I'm curious why, why is it that people even want them? In other words, why are we so fascinated? We're living here, why are we so fascinated? Is it because it's the nature of, I mean, if we just step back for a second, is that what we're all on a journey towards? Is where we're going? Is it, is it like, why so many, even me today, I'm like, so uh, are we gonna do a reading while you're on the show? Like, you know, every single person in the world right. wants to hear that from you, right? So why is it this topic of death and our loved ones being gone? I mean, it, it, maybe it should be obvious, but I think it should be looked at. It's probably never even been out. Like, why are we so fascinated with that? I think it's because it's the great unknown. Mm -hmm. Because it's the great unknown and because grief and love are the, you know, the same coin, but just two sides, mm. they're the same. Like grief is the other side of love. Mm. So when we don't have the physical receptacle for the love, we don't know where to put it. It turns to grief within. Mm. So I try to get people to still be able to direct that love to the consciousness. Mm. And that even though dad's not in the physical body, dad still exists. Mm. And even though like we can't see him, we can feel him, hear him, and connect with him just on a different level. Hmm. So I get people to look at that. So I think it's the great unknown. I think it's the, the absence of the person. It's the fear of there being something else. You know, like, it, there, there's a, I think there's a lot that goes into it. But I think as, as humans, we, we relate to story. Mm -hmm. And I think we relate to identifying with someone else's journey and their story. Mm. And I, I found that you know, most of my practice was one-on-one -on -one stuff for a lot of years, and then I couldn't keep up with the people that wanted to see me. So the next thing was to do small groups. Those groups became bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. and it was way before there was any media attention. Mm -hmm. That was just by nature of word of mouth. And then when the TV happened and the media yeah. happened, radio happened first, I loved radio, um, it just blew up that circle of people. So then the groups became bigger. Mm -hmm. And I always felt like, well, what, what can I do for these people? Mm -hmm. Well, I can teach them. I okay. can teach them because I can't read for everybody. So I can teach them. And then I like feedback. So I'd ask people like, you know, I've seen you at like six of my events. No offense. Why, why are you keep coming? Yeah. You know, like, yeah, you're going to hear some of the same stories. Like, why are you keep coming? Yeah. And they were like, we, we just feel better. Mm. And I'm like, tell me why, mm. tell me why you feel better watching other people get read. Mm. And they said, because it could be us. Yeah. And sometimes we don't want the reading. We just want to be in the energy of watching it happen. Mm -hmm. And I realized in that moment, that was what the success of crossing over the TV show was. Yes, it is. Because people could literally just vicariously yep. lying in bed at night, watch the show and go, that could be me. Yes. And if their mom's okay, my mom's okay. Yep. And I had to go like, you know, okay, mm -hmm. I have to appreciate what people are telling me. Because for me, it was like, I had the luxury and I say luxury because it really was a luxury of being popular where I wouldn't have to worry about somebody sitting in front of me again for a long period of time because mm -hmm. they couldn't get in front of me. Yes. So I was like, I didn't have to really, but then when I started noticing like the people in the front row were the same people in the front row, Interesting. city after city, it kind of creeped me out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't want a groupie. I didn't want right. people showing up like that. Mm -hmm. And there was a guy that came to a lot of my groups and then he actually wound up flying back to LaGuardia, like we're on the same plane. And um, mm -hmm. he came up to me and he said to me, do you ever think, do you ever think that you just bake really good cake? And I like, my New Yorker and sense of security was where I was at because mm -hmm. the guy was now on my plane and he was like at a bunch of my events. And I had this like, what? Yeah. And what he was doing was quoting me. And what I tell people is that if you're at an event, if you come to a Zoom, if you're watching a TV show where someone's being read, even though the birthday or the reading is for Mike, mm -hmm. if we're all in the room, we get a chance to have a slice of his cake. Yes. So it's not my birthday, it's his birthday, mm -hmm. but I get, I get a chance to have a really good slice of cake. That's what I hope today is for and, people. And that's what this guy said to me. Yeah. He was like, I'm not coming to you for a reading. Yeah. He's like, you just bake a really good cake. Mm -hmm. And so good. I was like, then I felt like an asshole because he was like using my own quote back to me. Right, and, you know, right. No, but I, I watched, uh, I don't know if I watched every crossing over, but I bet I did. Thank and you. Uh, I even watched repeats of them. I already know what you're going to say and that they confirm it. And then I would just watch it again. And I think one of that was, at least for me, I think one of the reasons even achievers maybe have a heightened awareness of this is I think one of the most profound, the two most profound times in our life are, is our childhood yep. and the impact that has on us. You've talked about your alcoholic dad. I had one. We both talk about that a lot. We, we tend to talk about our childhoods a lot because of the imprint it makes on us. And then death. 
Those are the two most powerful moving components of our life, and we've, we, we tend to live in both of those spaces consciously most of the time, even though we don't wear of it, or unconsciously, rather. You're replaying your childhood all the time. These emotions that you experience on a regular basis, even you get the same five, six, seven emotions almost every single day, these patterns we were just talking about. The average person experiences the same five or six emotions, and even if they don't serve you, you find a way to get them every day. So if your emotional home is bliss, ecstasy, passion, joy, and peace, you get it. But if it's anxiety, worry, fear, depression, and anger, you still find a way most days to get those emotions, don't you? Because it's your home. You, you move towards the familiar in your life. And people are addicted to the needle of negativity. Hmm. What do you mean by that? They need that, they need that hit of keeping them within the space of what they're familiar with. Hmm. So I like folks to know that habit does not equal happy. Wow. Habit does not equal happy. Mm. And the two words start with ha. Mm. And when we don't get out of that, it's like the universe going, ha ha. Because habit does not equal happy. And people good. get fear-based mm. and they stay within. And that's why somebody who is in a, an abusive relationship will muster the strength and control to leave that abusive relationship. And they, they walk out and they, they feel great and they think they're done because they left the abuse, but they don't realize it's up here that mm -hmm. they need to also change because mm -hmm. then that client winds up dating somebody who's equally as abusive but in a different way that's masked that they didn't see because they pulled that back in. That's exactly what I meant earlier when I said you switch people but are in the same relationship. It's yeah. a, it's, I call that fractions, mm -hmm. fractional relationships. Mm -hmm. And we have to look for the common denominators because sometimes they're not obvious. Yeah, and by the way, you can switch houses. You can upgrade from an apartment to a house and still be in the same emotional space. You can upgrade from being broke to getting some money in your pocket and still live in the same emotional space. So the, the key to your life is the quality of your emotions the quality of your thoughts. And that's why this energy and these thoughts are something that need to be evaluated. Now you take it to the extreme because you're, 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 you know, by the way, that thing you said earlier about truth or love and grief being the same side of the coin. I've not ever heard that before too. And we'll talk a little bit about grief in a minute, but let's go to the reading thing for a sure. second, just so that people get into this space for a minute. They could make some, you know, have an awareness that they might not have right now. If you were reading somebody and you told me earlier, you would look into a blank space. Mm -hmm. What do you, it, does it look like it did even when you were an 18, 19 year old guy or is no, it different now? It's way different. It's way different. It's way, way different. So what do you hear, fee, <laughs> hear, see, feel now? So here are the terms. There's clairvoyance that people think about, right? Clairvoyant, people mm -hmm. will talk about clairvoyance and, yes. and that becomes like an interchange of synonym for psychic, but it's not. Clairvoyance is a word that translates to basically clear seeing. Okay. Clear audience is clear hearing. Clear sentience is clear feeling. So I'm pri primarily I'm clairaudient, so I hear thoughts. You're hearing. Right, I, I get downloads, right, like in words. Um, then I'm clairvoyant, close second, and then clairsentient, I get that, but not as strongly. Is that the normal pattern, or other people who do me. readings can be different? Some people, like I have a, a colleague who's really clairsentient. Okay. So he gets bombarded or downloaded with the feeling of something, okay. and then he has to struggle to try to find the words to put to it, and I feel like, like lazy, because I'm just like, Joe. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's like yeah. I get it and they say it. Yeah. Um, and I remember being about, I want to say I was about 20, 21. I was driving with a colleague, her name was Shelly Peck. She's now passed. And I had had a night of readings the night before that was just like the names I came through were like off the hook. Mm. Just it's like taking attendance. It was like awesome. Really? And the woman said to me, and I'll never forget, we were literally in front of this restaurant, stopped at a light called the Barefoot Peddler. And um, she goes, yeah, don't get used to that. And I went, what? Hmm. And she goes, it's going to change. Hmm. I'm like, what do you mean it's going to change? She's like, as you develop and grow and evolve in your abilities, she goes, the names are going to fall to the background. She goes, and you're going to get more information. And I remember going, well, I don't want it to fall to the background. I like this. I was like, I like it. It gets mm. people's attention. Mm. I go, they pay attention to everything else once they name their father. Mm. And she goes, yeah, well, she's like, I'm just telling you. She goes, mm. you'll still get it. She goes, it's just not going to be front and center. Front and center. And I was like, Psst. No, it's not. So now she's it, right. it comes, it, she's right. So now you're reading somebody, you're hearing things more than you're feeling or seeing things. I'm getting more of it. So okay. I'm getting it in exactly the same way. Okay. But instead of like one tennis ball of information coming at me where I grab it and go, Joe, now it's like standing there and there's hundreds of tennis balls coming at me. And if I grab whatever I'm grabbing, I can't grab them all. Okay. So it's like I'm being. I'm, the, I'm being immersed in the energy of the person who's passed, and then it's whatever I can capture, what I can see, hear, and feel, and then relate. 
And now it's at the point where it's what's the lesson for the person that I'm reading at the moment that's most important that they want to convey mm. that's going to help them at the intersection of me and them meeting. Mm. So it's less of me validating I'm talking to dad. It's like, okay, this first part's going to be invalidating that I've got dad, but this is where I got to take them. Mm. So the, it's, it's really, it's a very, very different place than where I was. And so much so that people have said, do you want crossing over to come back in reruns? Mm. And I'm like, no, not at all. And they were like, why? Mm. It would help a lot of people. And I'm like, it would, but it's not who I am today. So mm. I don't think it would be a really good depiction of what I do. Really? Because those people who would watch that show to come see me today would, would expect that version of me. Mm. And when I've sat in TV meetings, people would say like, oh, we'd like to have, you know, we, we want to do another TV show with you. Oh, sure. And I'm like, great, what would you like to do? And they're like, well, we can't do Crossing Over. And I go, neither can I. And they're like, why? I go, because I'm not that person. Hmm. I've got 20 more years of experience. I'm in a very, very different spot. The per person watching it, so when I would watch you, there were so many validations of things you would say. But I'd be like, well, how come you just can't get all of it? Right. In other words, like, <laughs> you get in an initial, why can't, why wouldn't the guy go, hey, it's John Johnson, dude. Tell him John Johnson's here, not initial JJ. So my, my favorite experience okay. happened with a producer by a guy named Brendan, who's probably out there watching. Okay. And Brendan had booked me on a TV show called The Charles Grodin Show. It was on CNBC a long time ago. I know who Charles Grodin is, and I remember the show. That's how old I am. Okay. Yeah. So he was an actor. After the show, yeah, after the show, show yeah. Brendan goes, dude, why has it got to be so cryptic? Mm. Why can't it just be like, I'm his dad, my name's Joe, I had lung cancer. Yes. And I looked at him and I went, I understand that, Brendan. Mm -hmm. I go, how do deaf people communicate? He goes, what? I go, deaf, D-E-A-F. Mm -hmm. How do deaf people communicate? Mm -hmm. He goes, sign language. Mm -hmm. I go, why don't they just talk? Mm -hmm. And he goes, what? Mm -hmm. And it's that, that moment of like, he's a TV producer and I'm like now saying something that completely mm -hmm. is politically incorrect. Mm -hmm. And I go, no, I'm serious. He goes, I go, why don't they just, just talk? And he goes, cause they can't. And I go, why not? He goes, cause they're deaf. And I go, right. I go, and these energies are dead. They're physically dead. They do not have a physical body. Okay. So they don't have the instrument to make sound. Okay. So here we have deaf people who have a physical body, okay. who have a hard time communicating in the way that people that are not hearing impaired would be able to understand them. Okay. So they find the easiest way possible, which is through symbolism. I go, so energetically, a medium is interpreting the symbolism. And by the way, it's gonna come across in their own frame of reference. So two, three, four mediums in a room aren't going to interpret the same exact thing in the same way unless they share and agree upon that symbolism. Mm -hmm. So when that person comes through, they go, oh, show him this. So for example, if you were the medium mm -hmm. and somebody wanted to convey to you, it's my birthday, mm -hmm. what would they have to show you to get you to think a birthday? The cake. They would show you a cake. I don't mm -hmm. see a cake. I see a white flower. If I see a white flower, it means happy birthday or congratulations. Why? That's how the symbol got developed for me. Okay. And the way it got developed is coming home, um, going home one day, driving next to a truck. There was a white tea, white rose tea company. Okay. Big white rose on the, on the, so now I'm doing a reading for somebody and I'm seeing a number and I'm like, what is the, whatever it is, the 19th mean? She's like, I don't know. And then I saw the white rose and I'm like, do you have any connection to a tea company? No. Do you have any connection to a white rose? No. But what is this number? Oh, that's the person's birth date. Mm. So now by correlation, things start to mean things patterns established, okay. which by the way, going back to energetic patterns, mm -hmm. those energetic patterns that we have in our lives that we make by choices are kind of also what they will do in our lives, where those energetic patterns will start to present themselves, where I say, don't look for them. Okay. But if you've lost a loved one, I guarantee you, some of you listening to this have had these moments where you start to notice unique patterns, like why am I seeing cardinals? Why am I seeing white feathers? Why are, why are dimes showing up and pennies showing up in places? Like, mm. And it's not like you're looking for them, but now you're starting to notice like, well, that's weird. Well, mm -hmm. that's weird. And then you talk to your sister and she's also seeing cardinals mm -hmm. or those things. So patterns of symbolism start to get accumulated and that now means, oh, that could be whomever that person is who's passed. Gotcha. Okay, I, that's fascinating because as you were talking, I'm like, well, the truth is if someone had passed away that just spoke a different language than you spoke, than the auditory response of them talking to you. Or animals. Made, or an animal, okay, okay. I did a group the other night where, no joke, a horse came through. Mm. Pretty much just the consciousness of the horse with mm. very specific information. And I'm not gonna lie, I tell you that 35, 36 years now into doing this, that I don't sit here and have like a, like a giggle going, 
I'm freaking bringing through a horse, like I'm talking to a horse. Yeah. Like, you know, it's not grandpa talking about the horse, it's the horse is actually coming through. What a trip. It is, it is actually, it's, it's pretty amazing. But if you talk to somebody who's an animal lover, if you talk to somebody who works with animals, it's not for them, because they know that there's an energetic exchange and communication in a non-verbal English manner where whether it be clicks or sounds or energy that they're training that animal to be able to convey to them or listen. My, one of my frustrations in my life are my limitations. Meaning, like we said earlier, my ability to coach or work with somebody, but then the limitation of once I leave me, them following up on something. Are the limitations of this frustrating to you since you touch so much of it? Meaning, you know, you wish you could call somebody and say, hey, you're about to have a heart attack or the limitations of the information you get. Is that a frustrating thing for you? No, the, that, that part of it, for mm -hmm. me, I recognize that there's limited things that I'm allowed to know because I can't get in the way of someone's line of probability. The frustration for me is I always want to be better. Mm -hmm. I want to be better. I always want to be better. I want to be more specific. I want to be more accurate. I don't ever want to be lazy at it. Mm -hmm. I, I always imagine in every private reading, Zoom group mm -hmm. event that I'm doing, that behind me to the right are the two old guys from the Muppets. Are you serious? In every event, <laughs> I do. You're a trip. I, I always imagine that Good. they're there waiting to pounce and critique everything. So I always want to try to be on my game at all times. You're a trip to me. So that part of it trips me out a little bit, just how you weave your humor into it. So a few things I want to go through because we're going to run out of time. And like, I knew this was going to fly and I don't want it to fly. So I'm going to steal some more time from you here. But, you know, for me, I've had a bad speech. I've had a bad business meeting. Sure. When I played baseball, I had a bad game. Do you ever have a reading where you're just, I'm wrong, I can't get anything, sure. I was incorrect? What sure. you, you have? Yeah, absolutely. Anybody who says that otherwise is incorrect. Mm -hmm. You know, There are people that you just sometimes can't connect with or, or can't read or I don't understand what something is. Or, mm -hmm. um, and I'll say to like, you know, I might not be the right person for you. And then in that moment I go, but why are they sitting in front of me? Okay. So then I'll take, if you know, they're scheduled for a private reading and I can't make that connection, then I sit with them and go, listen, clearly there's no charge on this. I go, but let's talk. Mm. And I want to know, I want to know why the universe put them in front of me. Sometimes it's because I might be able to rec get them to recognize they didn't need a reading. They needed a grief therapist. Mm. They didn't need a reading with me. They needed their astrological chart done. They didn't need a reading with me. They needed to save that money because they're in foreclosure on their house. Right? Okay. So it's like, I find what that reason is. I still spend the time. You find why it's happening for you. I'm always looking. Yeah. I tell people, if you look for the why, if you ask the question why, you become wise. Mm. Yeah, I've, I've been, we're, we share so much in common. By the way, I was gonna wear those exact shoes today, which is really a trip. Those are literally the shoes I had on earlier. This is so weird, because your feet are moving. I just looked, I had those shoes on earlier. Yeah, and we're wearing the same pants. Anyway, we're not actually wearing the same. He has a pair of pants and I have a pair of pants. <laughs> we're not in the same pair of pants. People off camera are starting to dominate the interview. But um we we both have our own pants on if you're listening to the audio version of things but i gotta tell you um i i it's fascinating to me because you weave humor into it at the same time earlier we we're talking about grief off camera you said something so profound which was that you think the real grieving year for something is the second year i want you to talk about that for me because grief can be someone's past grief can be a relationship ended grief could be i've lost a business yep talk about grief for a second dealing with grief and then also weave in that second year part for him so i think when I talk about grief being the other side of love, mm -hmm. grief is natural and normal, and it's something that nobody prepares for. And then when it shows up, mm. it's like you're being hit like in the hardest possible way everywhere. It's debilitating, and it can create disease. Mm. Grief can create disease in your body if you don't honor it. And it is extremely patient. It is one of the most patient emotions that I think that we have. Like it goes, now? No? Okay, I'll wait. And it just sits back. Wow. It just waits. Wow. So it is the you know, not to be crass, but you won't forget it. It's like gas, better out than in. So mm -hmm. whether you're navigating it, treating it, honoring it, that's the place to come from. You wanna mm -hmm. honor the fact that you're feeling it. Mm -hmm. And I think when we lose a person, and specifically to death, when we lose a person to death, the finality of that is unbearable. It is the fact that they're gone, like that person is gone, it is unbearable. And sometimes people find themselves immobilized. They can't move. Mm. And they, they make decisions that are, are, are not logical. And mm -hmm. people be like, what's wrong with you? It's like, oh yeah, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to put my keys in the oven. Or, right. you know, I, I left my car running and walked home and forgot that it was at the mall. Like, yeah. like people have done some crazy things yeah. and it is coming from a place of grief. So I like people to honor what that is. And by honoring that, 
and this is where people don't always love to hear what I have to say. Mm. The first year of loss, if anybody's in the first year of loss, it is what I call the coasting year. It's where you're sliding and coasting from date to date and event to event, mm. birthday to holiday, and you prepare for all those things so that you're not surprised. You know, mm. and you put on the happy face and you navigate what you have to have. And then you go like, okay, I did this. And then you have support from the people that love you. Mm. They're there for the first birthdays and the holidays and they try to do that. The second year, the second year is the harder one. Mm. If you're in the second year of loss and you think, what's wrong with me? Nothing, there's nothing wrong with you. Mm. It's the support system that you had has now gone back to their lives. They feel like they helped you. They got you through the first year. Yeah. Um, and they don't realize that that person's still not coming back. Yeah. You know, in the second year, they're still not coming back. So mm. if you've been through the first holidays and the first events and the birthdays and you're feeling a little bit worse this year, you're okay. Gosh, that's so good, brother. You're okay. That is so good. See, the thing about I knew it was going to happen today was I knew we would be everywhere but the same place at the same time. Like, I, did, I do this. We were talking about it together. I just want people's life to be better. Right. I feel like every topic we've been covering back and forth is improving their life to some extent. And, and different parts of this interview will hit different people as they need it during that time. I wanted to ask you about just death in general. Sure. So everyone listening to this or watching this has had someone they love pass away or will right. for sure. You, and done, they will. And they will, right? right. That's a great point. What, what would you just tell us about it? The journey, the process of it? what it means just because I think it's the ultimate question of life. Prepare for it. Prepare for it. How do you do that? By talking about it. We live in a society where people don't talk about death. We live in a society where death is used as a trove. We live in a society where people are shocked and stunned that 540,000 people died from a virus. And, mm -hmm. you know, I wrote a newsletter last year that, you know, I, I kind of like have a group mentality in my office. And I wrote, the, I wrote the newsletter and I preface this by saying that my background, I'm a few credits short of my master's in healthcare and public administration. So this is not just from a psychic standpoint, mm -hmm. it's what my degree's in. Um, and I would have a full on master's if my mother didn't die. I was in an accelerated program. I just said I, I, couldn't, I had to get out mm -hmm. um, and start life, right? Yeah. So that being said, I wrote this newsletter about how the government of the United States was actually handling the pandemic last year. And it flipped everybody out that was connected to me I because I was going too political. Mm -hmm. And I was like, are you people really serious right now? Like you realize that like 35,000 people have lost their lives and we're going to be looking at a lot of people passing and that if I can make a difference, I can make a difference. Mm -hmm. And they, when I tell you, like beg me not to send this newsletter because of, you know, you know, they were just so concerned. Of course. And I said, you know, I like the fact that I empower people enough that you're saying this to me. I go, you're putting me in a position that's extremely uncomfortable right now mm -hmm. because I feel so strongly about this. Mm -hmm. I said, but I've, I'll be hypocritical if I send this mm -hmm. because it's going to be disempowering to everybody that I've empowered, mm -hmm. including my wife and son. Mm -hmm. So I said, I am going to not send it. Mm -hmm. I go, but I'm going to put you all, all on notice that every 10,000 people that pass, I'm going to remind you that I didn't send it. So what happened? I have reminded a lot of people. I mean, so that, that is like hundreds of thousands of people. So their point was it wasn't something that I would be able to control. Mm -hmm. So I say to people that grief is a very real thing to me and death is a very real thing to me and honoring that is a very real thing to me. And I felt that it was not from a governmental public health standpoint prepared, mm -hmm. discussed, treated as being real or honored. Mm -hmm. And I think that when we come from a operatic standpoint, always talking about me, 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 mm -hmm. then we don't forget that there's a you in humanity. Mm. There's no, there's no me in humanity. Mm. And I think that we have to put humanity first. Yeah. We, 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 right. Yeah. So and, yeah. when we talk about death, we have to honor it and then we have to reframe it. If we talk about looking at the birth of a child, we have kids. Yeah. You know what it's like to have a kid. Mm -hmm. There's that conception. Mm -hmm. There's the nine months there's the getting ready for it. Mm -hmm. There's the recognizing that we contributed to the process as a man, mm -hmm. but that the phenomenal aspect of what a woman does in making a human yes. and how you're reminded always that yeah. they're making a human. Like yeah. my wife would tease me all the time. I'd be like, can we do this? She's like, I am making a human, <laughs> right? right? So <laughs> when we look at that, there's an excitement and enthusiasm and everybody in our circle, our friends and our family, they're all waiting for that big moment. They're waiting for the phone call. They're excited. Mm -hmm. But when that baby comes into the world, that is a traumatic experience for that child. Mm -hmm. It is leaving a place of comfort, of nurturing, of security. 
and it's going to go through trauma, hmm. but it's going to be met by people and friends who are waiting for them and excited to have them. There is no difference between laboring to come in this world and laboring to leave. We are met by family on both sides. And for anybody who's been touched by COVID and you couldn't be there for somebody when someone passed, remember this, nobody passes alone. You might not from an ego standpoint have been able to be there for yourself to wish them goodbye. You might not have been able to hold them and hug them in the physical, but rest assured that loved ones and friends are there to greet that person as they make that transition. Nobody passes alone. Okay. That's why you flew here. That's why you flew here, right there. I, I, I want that to be the first thing in the dadgum interview. Everyone, please tell me you stuck around to hear this and listen to that. That's why you left here. I'm picturing that baby being born. I'm picturing the trauma that it goes through. I'm picturing the, even the pain part of it for everybody involved, the mother and the baby. And then that beautiful moment where there are the loved ones there waiting for them. Man, oh man. So unbelievably awesome right there. Like I'm not very quiet on the show very often. You got me thinking right there. Because I do, I do talk about death a lot. And I do think about it a lot. And I, for me, it's a motivator. There's things I'd like to accomplish in the physical before I leave. And so I'm not afraid of looking at when those things are coming. It's, a, it's almost an inspiring event for me. I have faith. I know where I'm going. But at the same time, I am on limited time here physically. Right. And I think some people, because they're so afraid to look at death... They've actually deluded themselves into thinking they, they actually know, but they act like daily, like they have forever. You know, you, you, you need to get after your dreams. You need to get in that relationship you want to have. You need to tell the people around you that you love them now because you don't know if tomorrow is promised. Right. And that's one of the lessons of doing this show is I do think about death. I do think about that departing time. And I think that's why, you know, even my dad passing, you know, we talked about him passing. It was one of the blessings people say, you know, I want to go suddenly. You know, one of the blessings of my dad having a prolonged illness, obviously the discomfort and pain he went through is something I wouldn't wish for anybody. But it was also the preparation we got to have that was a blessing. And so there's a blessing on all of it if you can find the blessing in there. That's unbelievable what you just said. Like I'm stunned by how beautiful that is. And I'm stunned that I'm almost 50 years old and I've never heard it said that way or viewed it that way before. So thank you for me. My pleasure. Thanks. For, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to reach an audience of people that maybe have no idea who I am and what I do and what this is. And mm. so I appreciate that. And for those people, you know, they might not know me from crossing over or from mm. reading a book, but I know they might know me from South Park. So you are that, sitting that's right. with the biggest douche in the universe. So that's let's exactly not, let's right. Not, let's not way. let that go. That's right. That's, <laughs> that's actually very, very true. And by the way, that on that show, and the other thing is, I, if someone doesn't know you, it would blow my mind because I'm so familiar with you. I want to ask you one last thing just because it's just part of what people deal with every single day. And I've watched you. You handle things with a humility that's remarkable. I've always seen that in you. I've always seen someone who believes in what he believes in but conducts himself with really a tremendous amount of humility for having, let's, let's just be honest, there's some weight with what you deal with. There's some weight to it. There's uh, the, the topic itself is as heavy a topic as you can get, which is people's lives and their deaths and their, and their souls. And so, but you've also had to carry with you, everyone chasing a dream out there that's listening to this is going to deal with haters, mm -hmm. um, skeptics and cynics to mm -hmm. use the two words you used earlier. You've lived the majority in your, of your life with, attacked. attacked with a lot of people who love and believe in what you're saying, but everywhere you go, there's that I that you get, that thought that you get. And I think a lot of people at, to some level can relate to it, not to the level you have. How have you dealt with that and does it ever wound you? Because the last piece of chasing the dream is everything we've covered, but then there's the other piece, which is you're going to have people that are skeptical, that are cynical of you. Not to maybe the extent you have. How have you dealt with it? And what advice would you give to somebody who, whatever they're pursuing, is going to have those people in their lives? I think you have to know your truth. And if you know your truth, then somebody else can't define it and, and define the narrative, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we joke about the South Park thing. That, you know, although huge, right? Mm -hmm. It's huge. And still to this day, I like, you know, I, I, get the, I get it on Twitter. Here's how I look at that. Every... Every negative thing that comes out is a platform for a conversation, mm. period, right? So there are kids that were born after crossing over was off the air mm -hmm. who have no idea and would have no idea who I am and what I do, okay. yeah. who have now found me mm. because of that show.
Mm-hmm. So that show became a billboard for grief in a different way for kids to learn about the afterlife energy and that their sibling, their mom, their cousin, their dad, their grandfather, whoever that is still with them Mm -hmm. because that, that has now sent them from that show to YouTube, to wherever, Yeah, finding clips like this Mm -hmm. to go, huh, I didn't think about it like that. Mm -hmm. So I think like that, I think you look at it and did you think about it that way in the moment though? Um, yeah, you did. I did. Okay. I I mean, I've literally had interviews that are like gotcha journalistic interviews Mm -hmm. where you you name it. You know, I remember walking into a crossing over and um, one of the executive producers said to me, how you doing? I'm like, I'm good. Yeah. Not thinking anything like had happened, you know, Mm -hmm. and she's like, you're holding up. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. I go, long day today. And Mm -hmm. she's like, I just want to make sure you're good. I'm like, I'm good. (laughs) And then I walked in. And everybody was weird. Mm. And I'm like, what's going on, guys? Yeah, what happened? Like, what's going on? And they're like, oh, nothing. I'm like, okay, listen, mm. everybody's being weird. Mm. What's going on? And Time Magazine had wrote, written an article mm. about crossing over. Mm. I didn't know this. Without coming there. Mm. And it was scathing. Mm. And it became like a huge deal back then. Mm. And then like other organizations were picking up on it. Sure. And like Larry King Live, you know, talk about Larry, like they were doing a show about my show and other psychics were going to be on talking about it. And I was like, well, I'm not, I'm not going to defend what I do. Mm. I go, I'll explain it and I'll talk about it. I go, but I'm not going to be put in a position of defending it. And I mm. said, because the moment you have to defend something, you're admitting something's wrong. Mm. I go, and I'm not going to be defensive of what I do. Mm. And then I remember one of the guys, one of the camera guys came over to me and he goes, I'm really, I'm really sorry that you're being put under the screw, the microphone, like the uh, microscope like this. Yeah. And I was like, dude, I go, it's been, it's been my entire life. He goes, yeah. He goes, but it's not been ours. Mm. And when he said that, mm. I went back inside. Mm. I called the publicist and I go, put me on. I said, I'll do Larry King tonight. Mm. And they were like, why? I go, I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for them. I said, because everybody on the show right now, their credibility is under attack. Mm. I go, and that I'm not okay with. Mm. So that was the only time where I, but otherwise I'm like, you know what? It is what it is. People are going to be people. It's like, I, I've heard the same things over and over again. Right. And knowing your truth, no matter what you're pursuing is so huge. I, by the way, I, I'm under, I'm not delusional. I knew having you on today that I will have people that will be concerned. What I wanted to do today, which it's certainly done for me, is spur conversation, as you just said. Right. Spur conversation, get people to evaluate their own belief systems, get them to evaluate their energy, get them to evaluate their life and their death. If listening today keeps you, gets you even more committed to what you already believe, wonderful. If listening today gave you a chance to really evaluate the energy and the people around you and the lasagna you're making and the people that are in your pool, wonderful. If it's dealing with grief, beautiful. And I, I gotta tell you, it's really great to do this with you today for me. Thank and you. I, and I, uh, I'm really grateful that you were willing to come all the way here and feeling your energy in person. You have an amazing energy. Thank you. Uh, you have a loving energy and a giving energy. And uh, I know that everybody in my house has already felt that today too. So I'm super grateful for you. And everybody, if you were fascinated by what John has to say today, you should go follow him on Instagram. Is it, is it just at John Edward? Uh, you should know your own it Instagram. Is, it is at psychic medium J E. Okay. There you go. So at psychic medium J E and uh, today, t- here's what I know just happened. People are talking about this. People cool. are sharing it. Um, their lives were improved by it. And, uh, so I'm very, very grateful for it. And everybody out there, I hope you do share this with people. Um, I hope it really made you think today. I hope it made you evaluate all the people around you and your energy. I hope it made you just look at your own life and your own death and what you're grateful for. And, uh, that you have your mind open and that you're more committed to what you already believed and that you, you know, are looking at new ways to view the world and view your life. And that's why I do the show. So just want to say, God bless you to everybody and max out. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around. If you'd like more, click the videos right here. They're exactly what you need to see next. And if you're new here, hit subscribe and become a part of the Max Out community. And tell me what you think about the videos in the comments below. I read all of them every week and I select winners that get all kinds of prizes, gear, coaching calls with me. Make a comment.